This is going to be a very short intro, because I don't know anything about this PC. Years ago I found this mustard yellow cannon listed on an auction site. And the main reason why I picked it up was because there was absolutely no information about this machine on Google. I couldn't find a single line of text about this PC. That's actually quite remarkable. Here we have a PC made by one of the largest tech brand names in the world, with no information on Google. So apparently the mighty Canon made a PC, and I guess they must have failed miserably. And as usual, there is a problem with this machine, as it always is on this channel. My old label on the top of the case says Magic Smoke. I actually remember the very quick test that I did with this Canon, because it was a rather spectacular show with a bang and a decent amount of smoke. It's a shame I didn't have the camera on. I don't remember if it worked. Apparently I forgot to write it down on the label. But it's probably not working. So let's explore this mysterious Canon PC, find out what it's all about and see if we can fix it. At the front there is a tiny label that says 12 MHz, so that's our first clue. At the back there is a large sticker that says Canon A200EX2 HD20. And a rather silly serial number that doesn't make much sense. By the way, there is a 9-pin video connector at the back, and a small cover with a label that says EGA Switch. So there's our second clue. Canon obviously didn't make millions of these seemingly unknown machines. But hey, who knows? It's weird how unsold machines were stored away for decades. You may have seen Adrian Black's video about the Nabu PCs, so maybe one day someone will put millions of these up on eBay. And by the way, I did order one of those Nabu machines, so let's hope some clever hacker will help us make them useful. So let's see what's inside this Canon branded case. Well, it contains a lot of bad smell, <laughs> that's for sure. Man, that's a smelly machine. So we're gonna need a lot of cleaning here, but I can't see any dust. And I'm gonna begin by removing this piece here, because it's really badly yellowed. And I want to start the treatment as quickly as possible. And hopefully it will look much nicer towards the end of this video. Okay, all bets are off. Let's find out what this is. Uh, there is a piece of paper tucked inside here. Before we continue, I'd like to thank our sponsor PCBWay. Aside from making excellent PCBs, they also do CNC machining, sheet metal fabrication, 3D printing and injection molding. Check out their shared projects page, where you can find some really cool projects for your vintage PC. Get an instant quote now at pcbway.com. And unfortunately it's not a secret message from the past. It's just the jumper settings for a 1.2 meg Panasonic drive. So I guess someone printed this document and stuck it into the machine. And unfortunately it doesn't have any dates, so we don't know when. And by the side here we have a hard drive. I think my initial guess was wrong. I was expecting a 360 drive in this machine. And it's a Miniscribe model 8425. And that's a 21 meg MFM ST506 drive. And we have our first date here, 20th of June 1988. So this machine is newer than I thought. And the hard drive has this extra ground lead going directly to the motherboard and that cable is also hooked up to the floppy drive I guess we might as well disconnect both drives so we can get stuff out of the way and get closer to the motherboard yeah there really isn't much dust in here and that's surprisingly clean 
And on top of the drive we have all the jumper settings for the motherboard. That may come in handy. And the note that someone left inside was correct. I checked and that is a Panasonic drive for sure. I guess we can move on with the power supply. Uh, that looks pretty standard. And I can see some dust inside the power supply. So someone has enjoyed this machine at some point. Probably a very long time ago. Yeah, the power supply and the cables look pretty standard. And inside here we have the original battery. So I must have forgotten to remove it. But luckily I can't see any leakage. Thank God. Uh, I guess we need to remove that power switch to be able to remove the power supply from the case. And we are gonna have to crack that power supply open to look for reefers and clean it out because it's pretty dusty. So if we remove this MFM controller we should be able to see the motherboard. And we have a mix of 8 and 16 bit ISA slots. Okay, let's see what we've got here. And we've got a Paradise graphics chip. Uh, the chipset seems to be from chips, but I still can't see the CPU. So I guess we will find a CPU underneath that floppy drive. And apparently the drive cage is not removable. So 16 bit slots and a 1.2 meg disk drive. You probably guessed right. And apparently we need to remove the standoffs. Okay, let's see if we can get that board out. And here she comes. If I can get it unstuck. That's a pretty tight squeeze. Uh, that's also a pretty damn large motherboard. I guess I'll move it to the workbench for a better view. And if you guessed that it's an AT clone, you would be right. Apparently this is a fast 286 running at 12 MHz. I don't know if it was designed for the Canon or if it's just a generic board. If you recognize it, let us all know. Apparently it has an award BIOS. And uh, this board is quite bloody sizable. There is some text down here, but it's mainly just numbers and made in Taiwan. So that doesn't tell us much. It does have some decent graphics on board, produced by this Paradise chip here. And it's a 3831.5B. And it has its own EGA2 BIOS. It does have an interesting bodge here, so this leg here is cut off. And on the other side there's a resistor and bodge wires. Presumably made at the factory. And it's an extremely clean board. Apparently Canon took flux cleaning very seriously. For whoever made this board. And now to the bad bits. I went through all the tantalum caps and none of them has popped. And that is what I thought was the problem with this board. And the second bad thing about this board. Those are all MT RAMs. And they are so many. Yeah, even the VRAM is made up of MT RAM chips. So fingers crossed that they are still good. I really don't feel like putting all of those chips in sockets. That is a massive soldering job. Well, I don't think the problem is on the motherboard actually. So I'm just gonna soak it in alcohol. And we'll take a look at the controller. And the controller looks good too. I can't see anything blown on this PCB. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if we found a reefer cap in here. Or perhaps a blown tantalum. And it needs to be cleaned anyways. If I can figure out how to get inside this Aztec 
branded power supply. And by the looks of it, this piece here should slide off. But I'm not sure. Hmm, that's a weird one. I've never seen a power supply put together quite like this. Ah, finally. Okay. And it has PCBs on both sides. So, I think we need to remove at least one of the PCBs to be able to see anything here. So, this machine hasn't been powered up in years. So, those caps should be safe for sure. And the PCB is stuck in something. And I can't quite see what. Ah. And apparently it's also held in place with this plastic clip. And apparently it's something else. Let's try to remove the PCB on this side too and see if that helps. Uh, yeah, this power supply really wasn't made to be serviced for sure. And the usual disclaimer applies. Don't mess around inside power supplies. They can have dangerous voltages, even with the cord unplugged. Yeah, this is really not a service friendly power supply. So that's really not <laughs> ideal. But this should be enough for an inspection and a cleaning. And that is not a Rifa, that is some other brand. So I don't think the fault is inside here either. Although it is going to need quite a lot of cleaning. But I can't see any components that has popped. So this power supply is probably good. Well, in that case it must be one of the drives. Uh, I guess we'll start with the floppy drive. Because we probably need to clean those heads. And lubricate those rails. And cogs. And those heads actually look pretty good. Yeah, this drive is really clean. And I can't see any blown components on the PCB. I guess there could be some components underneath this board here. But that's quite a lot of work to get inside there. So I'm going to leave it for now. And the front panel is being treated with peroxide. Let's take a look at that hard drive. Perhaps our blown component is underneath the bracket. Now that would be a first for me. But it's definitely possible. I have to admit I was 100% sure that we had a blown tantalum cap on the motherboard. Okay, let's see what we've got here. Uh, this is starting to get bizarre. I clearly heard a component blow. So it should be quite obvious which component it is. If we can find it. So maybe there are components on the other side of the board. Well this is weird. What is this? Well there is some kind of crap underneath this transistor. And I don't know what it is. And where it comes from. And the only weird thing I can find here are this diode here. For some reason it has black legs. I've never seen a diode with black legs. So that is our only suspect so far. This is weird. I was expecting like a massive destruction zone. And the only thing I can find is a couple of black leads. Well, I think the reasonable thing to do now is to try out all the different parts and see where the problem is. If it's with the hard drive or floppy or the motherboard or perhaps the power supply. So I will clean all the bits and pieces up with some alcohol and we'll start doing some tests. Okay, let's start with the power supply. I decided to take it further apart to be able to clean it and inspect all the components. And I can't see anything wrong with this power supply. It seems to be rather well built with Nichicon caps. 
So I will just quickly reassemble it and we'll test it. Okay, let's check the motherboard for shorts. So the first 5 volt rail is good and the second yeah, that's good too. And the third, yeah, that one is good too. Then we've got a minus 5 volt rail. Yeah, that one is in mega ohms, so that's good too. And then we have the minus 12 volt rail. And that one is in mega ohms too. And then lastly we have the 12 volt rail. And that one is good too. And these are key and power good. Yeah, so we don't have any shorts on the motherboard. So those tantalums are probably still good. Well, I tried to measure the power supply without load, but it behaved really weirdly. So I have hooked it up to the motherboard now. Let's check the voltages. And I just heard a beep. So perhaps this board is actually posting. So let's see what we've got on the 5 volt rails. That is spot on. And uh, this one too. And a third 5 volt rail is fine too. Then we've got a minus 5. Uh, we've got nothing. So no minus 5 from this power supply. So that's a bit weird. And further down we have the minus 12. That one is good. And the 12 volt rail is good too. And then we have key and power good. Okay, so no minus 5. Oh, I think that was just a bad connection. Yeah, there we have it. So, minus 5 is working too. Uh, we might as well check the Molex. 12 volts and 5 volts. So, the power supply seems good and we heard a beep from the motherboard. Let's check that again. Yeah, that's definitely a beep. So, I think this board is posting. Let's find out. Okay, so the switches for the graphics are set for MDA, according to the large label on the drive cage. Let's flip that switch and see if it will post. And it does. So this board is posting. So I guess we'll move on and test the floppy drive. But yeah, this was excellent, so this is a good start. Okay, so the floppy drive is connected. Let's flip that switch again. And I think it's loading DOS. And it does. Excellent. So let's try it with the keyboard. Well, I don't have the original keyboard, but being a 286, let's try with an AT keyboard. And apparently we have 1 meg of memory. So it's a pretty high spec AT. And yeah, the keyboard works fine. So let's do a quick test with a hard drive controller before we do the final test with a hard drive. I just want to make sure it doesn't have any shorts. And it's good practice to check one thing at a time. Yeah, that works fine. So let's try it on hard drive. Well, the power cables are a bit short, so I'm kind of struggling getting everything on camera. So I guess I'll put the microphone close to the hard drive before I push that switch. Well, it didn't spin up. Well, we probably need to do some settings to make it work, if it works at all. But I was expecting it to spin up at least. Well, so far this project is quite a bloody mystery. Somewhere inside this machine, one of the components has blown out its magic smoke. And it's probably inside that hard drive. I did test that diode off camera and it's showing normal values, so it's probably something else. And why did Canon fail with this PC? The specs are okay for 1988 and the build quality is excellent. Looks are a bit dated for the year and IBM had moved to a more modern square design. Perhaps it was the choice of EGA graphics. 
IBM had already introduced MCGA and VGA about a year earlier with the PS2 line. And that's actually what I had as my first Wintel PC, a 286 PS2 Model 50. By the way, I didn't guess right either. With that EGA connector at the back and the way this machine looks, I thought we would find fast V20 inside. But now that I have checked, V20 is that fast actually came later, so they weren't quite available yet. The weather is crap, so the treatment of the front panel isn't quite finished yet, and I just ran out of time for this week. Well, this project together with the Commodore 486 is taking up my entire bloody workbench now. So next week we will have to finish one of the two. Thank you for watching, if you want to support this channel, like, subscribe, leave a comment, and ring the bell below.